Okay, welcome back. This is part two of our lecture on mannerism to the Baroque, uh, part of unit six. And as I was mentioning, there, you know, at the start of the Baroque, there was this kind of tension between um, people who really strongly followed Caravaggio versus those that saw Caracci as kind of like the the uh, the model of where art was going and what people should, um, you know, emulate. And as I said, in some ways, Karachi at the beginning was the more influential artist. And the reason for that was that Karachi, along with his brothers, um, were uh, instrumental in kind of set, setting up sort of a the very first art school. And it was through that that they had a lot of um, a lot of influence. And also, I think because their their point of view about art was more um, more conservative. Uh, one of the things that people felt about Caravaggio is that um, there was a lot of ambivalence about his his willingness to use very kind of everyday looking people in his paintings. Um, whether he was doing that in part as kind of like a political point of view, um, or you know like wanting, he, he often did say, or he's credited with saying that uh, he had read the Gospels and from you know, from what he read, uh, Jesus and his followers were all poor people. But I think also a lot of it is the fact that, you know, he wasn't living all that richly. So, you know, the people he could hire as models were going to be um, not the richest of people. But um, anyway, uh, the next artist I want to talk about um, would be Artemisia Janileski. And I think, I mean, she's a very interesting artist on her own right. Um, and we're going to look at Judith and, the maids, and her maidservant a number of times in a number of contexts. I think it's a very important and interesting painting. But one of the main things I want to cover here is how she's emblematic of kind of a struggle that a lot of artists were aiming for, which was sort of a balance between the two influences. And that at the beginning of her career, we saw her being a little bit more heavily influenced by Karachi, but more towards the end of her career, she was more and more influenced by uh, Caravaggio and and that interest in that kind of extreme one of the things about extreme tenebrism is that it really creates a very kind of dramatic scene and as we were going to learn as the more and more we look at uh, the Baroque drama creating a sense of heightened drama is a really important part of um, of the the Baroque and the dramaticness of that kind of extreme contrast and of these figures kind of like just emerging out of darkness was a really major part of that. And, but I, I do want to say Artemisia Janileski is um, just a really interesting, very talented painter. And, um, um, and you know, more than just the Judith and Holfrenes uh, works, although she did paint that theme in a number of different ways at a number of times. And those of you who want to explore the biography of Artemisia Janileski, you could see how that kind of um, relates strongly to her biography. But we need to move on and talk a little bit more about the Baroque. And so the artist that I think, uh, painter-wise, who is most emblematic of the the Baroque, in some ways it's like the, the high, um, high Baroque and kind of the exemplar of that, would be um, uh, Rubens. And Rubens was extremely influenced by, um, by Titian. He really, especially by you know, Titian's willingness to paint loosely and gesturally and allow the mark making, the gesture of his hand to show. And how, when you look at a painting, a great painting by Titian, and you're, you know, let's say 15 feet away from it, you don't necessarily see the marks, the marks all kind of coalesce together and your brain puts it together as an image. But then when you get up close, you can see that the whole thing is made out of all of these beautiful gestural marks. Um, and Rubens also um, aimed generally for a very kind of extreme change of value, but he was also looking for very kind of uh, rich colors. He had just a beautiful palette and loved um, kind of layering uh, colors to get uh, these kind of very lush surfaces. Um, but at the same time, uh, there was a sculptor who was probably in some ways even more emblematic of the Baroque, who's definitely probably the most successful Baroque artist, 
uh, in part because he was living in um, in Rome, in Italy, and he was the primary sculptor for the Vatican. Um, and so Bernini was, in some ways, um, the greatest of Baroque artists. But I think because in the end we see Baroque painting, Baroque painting as being the thing that's emblematic, we're, we're going to return to Rubens. But let's look at um, Bernini's uh, career for, for a while. And so we've seen Bernini's David earlier. And we've actually, I think we've seen all of these works before in various lectures. Um, and now you're probably beginning to be like, oh yeah, I can see how they're all the same artist. Um, and Bernini really defined um, Baroque sculpture, like pretty much for a hundred years afterwards, all sculpture just looked like um, either good or not so great attempts at uh, Bernini's style. He was so influential. He was also, like Michelangelo, very successful as a... Uh, as an architect, and he designed um, this uh, set of colonnades, right? That's opening um, at the Piazza of St. Peter's. He designed it, it did not look this way before. And um, this colonnade is um, a very uh, beautiful work and oh, an interesting um, point. The columns here are all in the Tuscan um, order, which was kind of a made up fictitious order that Renaissance artists came up with. They added a fourth order to the, you know, the classical orders of uh, Corinthian, um, Ionic, and Doric, and they added the Tuscan order, and that's the order that, uh, um, which basically the Tuscan order combines the best qualities of, or not the best, but like what they thought of as the best qualities of the Corinthian order and the Doric order. So back to Rubens. Like I said, I think because Rubens was a painter and because painting in the in the end, when we think of Baroque art, we think of painting. And when we when we think of Baroque art, we pretty much think of either paintings by Rubens or paintings that are very much influenced by Rubens' style. And he was um, you know, like the epitome of the Baroque artist. And also I think when we think of Rubens, we think of Baroque composition. There's a certain type of way that the paintings are composed in the Baroque that's slightly different from the way they were composed in the Renaissance. We're going to talk about that a little bit when we talk about page structure in another lecture in this unit. Um, but just to give you a very quick hint, one of the main things about a lot of Baroque um, uh, composition structures is that things are organized on along one of the diagonals, but then not along the other diagonal. Instead, in opposition to the first diagonal, like which is this diagonal, then the next thing are angles created by right angles going from corner to this diagonal, right? So if you could imagine like a straight line leading towards this diagonal, like a straight line going there and meeting at a right angle, that would be a line that would go like that. And then at this corner, that would be a line that would go like that. And you can see that basic structure to to paintings repeated over and over again, and not just in um, Rubens paintings, but also in, in just tons and tons of Baroque art. It became a very dominant kind of compositional structure. So here's some more. Ah, man, I love that two satyrs painting by Rubens. Uh, it's really beautiful. And I, and you may tell that I'm a huge uh, Rubens fan. And I think just there isn't um, anyone who is just so good at um, at creating like such changes of warm and cool on skin tone, creating these effects of both opacity and transparency. Um, right? That's my one minute warning, but I think we have enough time we can wrap it up because I believe that Velasquez is pretty much the end. Yes. So, um, so I just want to talk kind of briefly about Velasquez, who is um, one of the greatest painters of all time, let alone the greatest painter of the Baroque. Um, and maybe not as truly successful as Rubens was, but highly influenced by Rubens, um, actually knew Rubens. Rubens kind of took him under his wing. The two of them um, went on a trip to Rome together where they both went all over Italy looking at all the Titian paintings and Rubens taught him how to really admire. And you can really see in some ways, um, Velasquez is even more indebted to Titian than Rubens was, like his mark making um, hand is more apparent and more kind of gestural and and Velasquez has a very kind of like slashy kind of mark making system that's very um, 